Mike Holmes, the Dean of the College of Public Health, and on behalf of the co-sponsors of the evening, the College of Arts and Sciences, and the Gold Humanism Honor Society at the Quillen College of Medicine, it's a real pleasure to welcome you all to the 10th evening of Health, Wellness, and the Arts. This all began in 2011, um, when we wanted to highlight two of the many excellent things that ETSU does in health and the arts, particularly the performing arts. And over the years, we've had actors, musicians, comedians, filmmakers, magicians, and others. But we thought for the 10th, we should do something special. And there's really nothing that says health, wellness, and the arts in Appalachia quite like coal, right? The arts, you'll, you'll see and have seen wellness for many of our communities, it was the best paying job available. And then in terms of health, of course, it's, we all know it's, it's impact. So what we're doing this evening is sort of a multi, multi, uh, multi-modal approach. When you came in outside, you saw uh, photographs from Brad Owens, who's an MFA student here. Um, his title, his, his program was Reclamation of the Towns of the Virginia Coal Fields. Then you also saw books and photographs taken by Herbert Dotson, who's a retired coal miner from Appalachia, Virginia. Then you've been listening to, and in a moment we'll listen to even more, uh, the Twin Taters, which is a band in the student band in the Bluegrass Old Time and Roots Music Studies program here at ETSU. And I think you're going to get a, a, a really great introduction to how coal has impacted the music of our region. And then after that, we'll have the panel discussion with Ted Olson, who is a professor in the Department of Appalachian Studies, and he'll be talking about the history of coal in Appalachia. Then Ann Lewis, who's a nationally recognized filmmaker, professor of practice at UT Austin, the, the other UT. Um, I was going to say the lesser UT, but I didn't know who was here. Shall we talk about film as a voice for social change? And then David Blackley, who's an epidemiologist with NIOSH, the National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health in West Virginia, and an alum of the ETSU College of Public Health, will be speaking. So all of this is to give us an overview of art and coal in Appalachia. So to begin, let's go back to the Twin Taters and welcome them back to the stage.
comes from Jean Ritchie, who's from Viper, Kentucky. She's a really well known, well renowned old time singer. And this song is called The West Virginia Coal Mine Disaster. Oh, say.
I'm going to sing for you now another genius piece. This one's called Light Waters.
Franklin, the old time music program, is going to come up and introduce the band, and then maybe we can talk to him to play one more song.
as well because your instruments are under the stage and so you can't leave until, until we're done. So I'm going to ask our, our three panelists to come up, please. Uh, Ted Olson, Ann Lewis, and David Blackley will come on up. You all have their bios in your flyer, so I'm not going to reiterate them other than to point out something. That band that you just heard is part of the Appalachian Studies program, so is Ted Olson. And that just gives you the tip of the iceberg of the kind of excellence that we really do have here at ETSU in, in such a broad cross-section of areas. So Ted, I'll have you come up first and take, o take over from here. Thank you very much. Good to be here with these folks and with you folks, colleagues, friends, neighbors. Um, art is why I'm here uh, talking about coal because uh, as a boy I sold newspapers and one of the headline stories many years ago, more than 50, was a disaster in West Virginia, the Buffalo Creek flood during which time 127 people died as a result of a faulty uh, uh, slurry pond dam that broke and a wall of water washed a whole village away there in West Virginia. Um, a horrific story and a kind of, I was not living in a coal area of course, but uh, I was aware through that story and other stories uh, that came through the media about coal and um, so I became more interested in, and I wanted to know more about these people. These folks who made a living underground. And so I saw a film very shortly after that time, uh, Harlan County, USA, a true work of art, an Academy Award winning documentary film, filled with great music by people such as Nimrod Workman and Hazel Dickens and others. And uh, so through art, we learn about culture, we learn about history. Um, here's where we are, folks. It's such an honor to be here with you today. I teach a class called uh, Coal Mining and Appalachia. I've done so for more than a dozen years now. Um, I'm going to try to compress a whole semester's worth of learning into a 15-minute slideshow, so bear with me. Um, some of these slides you can find in other places, and I won't belabor what is, I think, well illustrated on them, but I think you can see that there are multiple types of coal, and they're used for different purposes. Uh, yesterday, of course, was the screening of King Coal, which was a tremendous uh, experience. And uh, there was a charming scene of the two young girls talking about how to pronounce bituminous. If you saw the film, you know what I'm referring to. But uh, there are different types of coal uh, found throughout the Appalachian region. Of course, anthracite further uh, north and east. Um, there are wonderful books, history books, and, uh, you know, uh, shall we say, geologic studies of coal mining and coal. And I'd be happy to talk with any of you individually about places, uh, sources of further information. But I think that gives you a sense of how coal was created, uh, geologically speaking. And there it is, um, flaking off in the person's hands. And uh, that's the entity that we're celebrating tonight. And uh, it's, we're also trying to understand the danger that it has brought to so many people, the, you know, the desire to capitalize on this, uh, this entity here, coal. The Appalachian Mountains, of course, not precisely what we're talking about tonight, but I just wanted to suggest that in Appalachian Studies, we differentiate between the Appalachian Mountains, which run all the way into Canada, and Appalachia, which uh, of course, is uh, a compressed, uh, kind of contained uh, subregion of the Appalachian Mountains, as it were. Now, Appalachia is not seen on this map. This map that you see here represents some high points across the Appalachian Mountains, which, as we said before, run from uh, northeast uh, Alabama, some would say north central Alabama, all the way up into. New Brunswick, Canada, and beyond, and kind of spilling over into the St. Lawrence, uh, Gulf of St. Lawrence. But uh, in any respect, Appalachia is a, is a contained space within there. Not viewable on most maps, but uh, it does exist as a political entity, according to the Appalachian Regional Commission, which we'll see. 
And that is the area that we principally study in Appalachian Studies at ETSU and within the Appalachian Studies network of schools and community groups. Um, I love raised relief maps because they remind you of the what the mountain range looks like from outer space. So if you were flying overhead, you would see something like this. And this gives you a relative uh, sense of where the high mountains are and where they're not. Important for this talk is where the high mountains are not to the uh, west of the higher knobs. And of course, the higher knobs are the, the Blue Ridge and, and all the Blue Ridge uh, region, as it's sometimes called by geologists, we'll see shortly is a low-lying region, looking almost like a piece of paper crumpled up and opened back up. It looks like a series of roughs, and those are the plateaus of Appalachia. And here we go. Here is a kind of delineation of the geological subregions of Appalachia. And again, we're using that compressed, uh, politicized uh, kind of subregion of the larger Appalachian Mountains chain, which is Appalachia as an economic unit with a strong political history, as well as its own uh, you know, cultural history that, that we've uh, talked about through the music and that we'll mention briefly here tonight. Um, importantly here, you'll see, of course, moving east to west, the Piedmont, uh, running through Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia. Then the Blue Ridge subregion, geological region. Um, and then the Valley and Ridge province, and that is where we are today uh, in Johnson City. The Blue Ridge is as close as Buffalo Mountain, but we are, in fact, in the Valley and Ridge, kind of bisected by rivers and ridges. And then moving westward, we enter coal country, the Appalachian Plateau uh, province, or uh, sub-region of the Appalachian uh, domain. Here is the Appalachian Regional Commission's uh, definition of Appalachia. And just to reiterate, this is an economic and political uh, kind of space uh, subdivided from the larger Appalachian Mountains chain, which run into Canada. Uh, the, the ARC, as we fondly call it, uh, subdivides each part of the states represented within Appalachia by, by counties. And these counties are then determined as far as falling into subregions here. These are the ARC subregions of that uh, economic and political entity of Appalachia. And here, uh, those counties are divided into five larger subregions, as the a ARC calls them. And importantly, here, these subregions are basically mapped out for you. The, the ARC boundary is shown as a mass unit here showing the states uh, through which the ARC works. Uh, it exists to provide economic support to these counties. That's its principal function. And you can see the counties uh, there to the right. The redder the county, the more, shall we say, uh, in receipt of federal and state funds, it's a federal state partnership, ARC is, uh, those red states are the ones, uh, red counties, I should say, are the ones that receive the primary funding through the ARC. There's a gradation scale of color that you can see there in the table below, and those are the criteria by which uh, the ARC determines how they'll delineate the funds. Um, importantly, the red counties are in conjunction with the coal fields, and so that's an important point to make. And okay, this map here deals with uh, the ARC counties, the economic levels, and distressed counties in red, you can see it more clearly here, are the ones that are primarily recipients of the, the lion's share of the federal funding through the ARC, and again, they're largely uh, conterminous with the coal fields. And you can kind of slot in where Washington County falls in this map, and. It's fascinating to look at the ARC website because you can see historically how the economic st uh, status of many of these counties changes over time. Uh, a more recent kind of uh, assessment of the economic health of Appalachia, as defined by the ARC, that the poverty rate is decreasing overall, but increasing in certain central and north central Appalachian communities uh, since 2008, and uh, the two areas that are where the concept of poverty, it's a 
controversial concept, but we'll, we'll use another term. Uh, economic uh, disparity from the national norm would be a way to define uh, poverty here. Um, the two areas that are increasing in that realm are uh, in conjunction with uh, the coal fields in, say, uh, western, uh, well, southwestern Ohio and uh, eastern uh, Kentucky and southwest uh, Virginia and so forth. Here's a sense of U.S. coal mining jobs, 1985 to 2014. And it's important to see that at one point, these are in the thousands of people, uh, 1985, you can see that there were approximately 170,000 coal mining jobs. Uh, and this would be uh, across the United States, so many of them were in Appalachia, but not all of them. And then you can see, starting in about 2010, with the beginning of the Obama administration, that uh, brownish line there, that uh, delineates where uh, the status of coal mining jobs in the United States at that point. What you can see by this uh, simple kind of diminishing line on the scale is that jobs diminished dramatically uh, in the late 80s into the 90s. And this would be in conjunction with the introduction of a form of coal mining known as mountaintop removal coal mining, which requires many fewer workers to uh, uh, kind of mine coal in those massive sites involving earth moving machinery and relatively few people. So the old days of underground mining and masses of workers was a thing of the past. It also is in conjunction here with the decline in the coal mining unions and the power of unions to support the jobs. Here's a, a change in coal mining employment, 2011, 2015. And I think what you see is uh, the red counties here on this particular map were the ones uh, where coal mine employment was more steady than the other places. And that has to do with the development of mountaintop removal sites uh, during that time period. And that's more recent, but uh, it does reflect that mountaintop removal coal mining has remained uh, you know, kind of the most active form of coal mining in recent uh, decades, last uh, probably three decades. Here's a graph that shows a, an assessment of the future of coal mining. The, the bright, flashy red areas are the areas where experts anticipate there will, will be continued mining into the future. And uh, then the blue areas are areas where coal mining will be most likely phased out over time. So it does give a sense of uh, you know, Eastern Kentucky, the Appalachian Plateau area being a, kind of a hotbed of future coal mining. Um, so much history involving the employment in the coal fields. And uh, here's just a graphic photo of that history in a nutshell. To be very brief here, uh, this graph uh, simply but uh, eloquently shows the different types of coal operations. And you can see that shaft mining goes straight underground. That's kind of a historic form of coal mining that's still practiced today. I've been underground uh, on an occasion. Uh, into a shaft mine uh, a mile and a half below the surface of the ground in southwest Virginia. And it's uh, those who did that, uh, do that for a daily uh, round of their, of their way of life. It's, it's an uncanny experience that, you know, I, I was just there for a day. And then interviewed people who did that for a lifetime. And it was marked to, to feel their pride in their jobs and their sense of uh, kind of mastering their fear on a daily basis. So that's a deep shaft uh, coal mining, underground mining. You can then also see adjacent to that slope mining, that uh, the entrance to the mine is through a slope to the seam of coal. And then above that is a drift mining, where you enter the, uh, the uh, shaft, uh, the, you enter, you build a shaft to enter the seam of coal, kind of uh, laterally with the surface of the earth. And then above that, is uh, mountaintop mining, where you can see the former gradient of the uh, original contour of the mountain being removed by earth moving machinery and put into a fill, a valley fill unit. Um, so you can kind of get a sense of the different operations that are practiced by the coal industry. Um, much more to say about that. Well, here's a course that I've taught. Many times I've taught it as 
an experiential education class. Now, I'm not suggesting I encourage students to go underground and, and mine for themselves. What I suggest by that is that I take them to meet miners. I take them to meet historians. I take them to controversial places to talk with controversial figures, such as this historian here. This is the controversial place, uh, the Whipple General Store. It's a company store in Scarborough, West Virginia. Our students from ETSU visit uh, these sites. This was closed down in 2019, but uh, for years I took students there to meet the owners who ran it as a private museum. And we get to hear stories about the uh, kind of the enforcement of law and order in the coal fields, such as in the general store section on that photo, where there's perfect acoustics built by the company such so that uh, company security guards can listen to conversations whispered at the uh, general store uh, desk there. Uh, perfect acoustics uh, were a part of the design here. You might say it's, it's a fortress. It's a fortress of law and order uh, maintained by this particular uh, coal operation in southwest, in, in southern uh, West Virginia. Um, one thing that we like to do in, in our classes is to look at art, look at uh, Coal mining is represented in music, such as uh, well-known songs, Merle Travis, Dark as a Dungeon, some of the wonderful songs performed by our, our great group tonight, Gene Ritchie and Hazel Dickens and Nimrod Workman and others, keeping this music alive as part of their cultural tradition, living in coal communities. So um, I often recommend that people seek out that tremendous box set called uh, The Music of Coal by Jack Wright which is a, a mother load source of great music about coal. We also study the literature of coal mining, such as this famous novel, Denise Giardina, a fictional uh, treatment of the Battle of Blair Mountain, 1921. Uh, many other works of literature. We look at many films in our classes. Uh, Mate Wan, of course, by John Sayles, which depicts the Battle of uh, Mate Wan, the, uh, one of the first of the uh, the, well, there were a series of them, but it was the one that we immediately preceded the Battle of Blair Mountain, and there's tremendous history about each of these, and we uh, learn about the artistic renderings of these stories in the coal fields, and then we interpret the deep history of those. And of course, uh, Anne is a tremendous filmmaker, and she'll be speaking to you shortly. Coal towns, we talk about the communities of, uh, of coal towns. A good friend of mine, Bill Turner, he, uh, grew up in a coal town at Lynch, Kentucky, and uh, he was an African-American family of coal miners in uh, Lynch, Kentucky. And we talk about the, the ethnic and racial diversity in these towns, and we utilize uh, works such as uh, Crandall Shiflet's uh, masterful work on coal towns, and we visit coal town sites on our field trips. Uh, we study, here again, depicts some of the ethnic diversity of coal mining historically. One thing that this photo does not represent, I'd like to call attention to, of course, are women in the coal fields. And we do talk at great length and utilize uh, historical accounts of uh, women in the coal fields. And of course, Merritt Moore is here tonight, a great historian and representative of that story. And I refer you to Merritt's work um, for further awareness of, of that story. Um, so we also utilize archives. We encourage students to visit archives, look at historical photos and interpret them. And I think you could see from this picture to this picture, moving back in time, how many aspects of the coal miners' experience changes. We go from more contemporary uh, lunch pails to uh, lunch buckets here, where they carried with them food and water and perhaps a Bible. Um, and uh, maybe uh, some other apparatus they might need if they were uh, caught underground in unforeseen circumstances. We visit sites such as this. This is the Inland Coal Company. If you were to go to this site today, it would be grown up into a forest all around the entrance place here. Very similar to this, though, is the Lynch, Kentucky uh, entrance area where you can, in fact, uh, ride a tram car underground. It's a, it's a museum site, and I've taken students there on many occasions. Um, so we, we learn experientially by visiting those sites. Um, utilizing photographs, we learn about issues involving unionization and, and uh, mine shutdowns and this sort of thing. You can see here, no work tomorrow. And of course, that uh, was a, a huge uh, 
factor that uh, the employment issues that affected the lives of these miners uh, was beyond their control in many cases, which of course led to the unionization effort where people sought to regain some control and autonomy over their lives. We study the history of coal mine strikes, um, historical ones and more uh, recent ones, through film and through historical accounts and, and through uh, first-person interviews with people who participated in them. Um, we talk about the, the equipment involved with uh, coal mining. And of course, here's an, an evocative historical photo, not so long ago, but uh, underscoring the fact of the, the daily danger that uh, coal miners uh, experienced. We look at uh, important uh, disasters, and of course, there are so many to talk about. Um, the West Virginia disaster song by Gene Ritchie that they performed so admirably just now is, is one other example of this. But here's kind of one of the biggest ones, historically speaking, and led to some new legislation. And often it, we find that coal mine uh, safety legislation follows major disasters. And okay, we also look at the cultural traditions of coal mine communities. Um, when I lived in the coal fields of eastern Kentucky, uh, many of my students were born and, and uh, reared in uh, coal uh, communities and in coal families. And they were intensely proud of their experience and they were proud of the uh, ability of their family members to work machinery such as this and make a, a proud living for their families. Um, I showed this photo at a recent Black Long uh, gathering and uh, the sponsoring uh, agent of the, of the gathering identified his cousin as one of these three gentlemen in this photo. So, I mean, it, they're close kinships within, uh, within coal communities for sure. We're going to hear more from David about mine safety, so just uh, we'll kind of represent some photos here. Black lung we'll talk about shortly, but this graphically uh, illustrates how silica in the lungs and leads to deterioration over time. Um, and of course, moving from underground mining to mountaintop removal coal mining, you can see the sheer violence involved with it. And of course, it does impact uh, those who call Appalachia home and who have uh, you know, family uh, deeded properties uh, that get co-opted by the coal industry. Um, we do in our class, Coal Mining in Appalachia, talk at great length about mountaintop removal coal mining as neutrally as we can. We try to maintain an open dialogue about coal mining, understanding that our students come from coal mine families as well as have very strong environmental perspectives and maybe have a, you know, an, an, a different attitude towards uh, uh, the role of coal mining. And, and, and uh, we try to get dialogue between people from various perspectives here. This photo, very briefly, talks about the uh, acreage of disturbed land in the uh, gathering of coal over 30 years. You can see mountaintop removal coal mining has uh, escalated the use of land uh, in the harvesting of coal. Here is a very brief kind of illustration of what happens at a mountaintop removal coal site. The original contour is kind of that ghostly figure at the top there. The coal seam is then uh, harvested after the uh, soil is put into the valley fill held back by a sediment pond and sometimes those uh, dams break and cause destruction downstream. You can see some uh, houses downstream and so that's to illustrate the danger that they are in on an on a ongoing basis. You can see what uh, kind of a bird's eye view of a mountaintop removal site. In our class we take students to visit these sites and ask for permission to uh, to visit them and generally speaking it's part of history and the communities allow it to happen. Um, the coal companies have long since moved out so it's up to the communities to kind of let us in and they usually are happy to share us with, share with the students the, the real experience of, uh, after the mountaintop removal coal operation is removed from the site. Um, environmental impacts, we talk about these in our class and you can see here four primary uh, impacts. There are others of course, water quality is worsened, stream flows increase leading to potential dam disasters, large tracts of forests are lost and of course uh, related to that displacement of species. 
And uh, so it's, it's an extremely impactful form of coal mining above ground. We talk about the politics of coal mining. We talk about JFK and RFK's visits to the coal fields playing an important role in national politics in the 60s. JFK and Lyndon Johnson leading to the creation of the ARC, which uh, certainly has made a huge impact upon uh, economic, um, you know, kind of leveling within Appalachia. Um, we talked about them earlier. And so, just to conclude, thank you for being here tonight to hear just a nutshell representation of a whole lot of, of history and cultural uh, information about uh, coal mining in Appalachia, and thank you so much. All right, now we're going to be joined by Ann Lewis, who I introduced earlier, to talk about uh, film as a vehicle for social change. Thanks. Okay, hi. <laughs> um, it's really great to be here. Thank you so much, and thanks for the lecture. That was wonderful. Um, I'm, I lived and worked in the coal fields from 1973 when I came to work on Harlan County. Um, and then uh, I left in 1998, but I worked with Apple Shop in Whitesburg, Kentucky for many, many years. And I continued to work with them after that. So I feel as though uh, my deepest ties are to the mountains, and particularly to the mountains of Southwest Virginia, Eastern Kentucky, that, that part, that subregion of the area. Um, so I'm going to share some clips from that work. And you have to really realize that any film work is collective, just as a band is a collective piece of art. So um, when I'm talking about these films, there are films. And they also belong to the subjects of the films. So just know that. Um, I wanted to begin with a piece of archival film. Um, that I used in a documentary about a 1989-90 um, Pittston, strike against Pittston coal in Southwest Virginia, which is a strike about health care, and I'm going to come back to that. Um, but the reason I want to show the clip is it's also fine art. I mean, I really think John L. Lewis is as good as any Shakespearean actor ever pretended to be. Um, so I, this is him testifying um, before Congress. And uh, I guess I double click here. 300,000 lot of men made victims. Some died, more than 6,000. Some lived, some lived blind. Some of the twisted backs, loss of limbs, paralyzed bodies, broken bones. The flesh burned off their faces until their grinning specters of men by gas explosions. They want the will of their farm call out. At the cost of this industry, a charge on a cost of production. If we must grind up human flesh and bones, in the industrial machine that we call modern America. Then before God I assert that those who consume the coal and you and I who benefit from that service because we live in comfort, we owe protection to those men first and we owe the security for their families if they die. I say it, I voice it, I proclaim it, and I care not who in heaven or hell holds it. That's what I believe about that. Okay, so um, I, wa I wanted to show this clip, um, and I'm sorry it's out of sync, but I don't think it matters that much. Um, because I think there's always this question about is documentary film really art or, you know, those kinds of um, sillinesses. And, um, and I, or that 
people seeing that politics and art are contradictory, and, and I don't believe that for a minute. Um, there's a, a French philosopher, Alain Badu, who um, says something, and this is a quote, um, only art restores the dimension of the senses to an encounter, a resurrection, or a riot. And I think uh, that's what we appreciate in work like the band that played and the, um, the wonderful picture that you showed of, uh, from Earl Dodder of the minor. I mean, there's just wonderful, wonderful art um, made around political um, uh, statements in a way um, or ideas. Um, I think every film that I've worked on has had some reference to health and wellness. Uh, so many things that bring profit for a few are directly connected to violence on the bodies and minds of men, women, and children in the region. Sometimes that violence comes from a lack of occupational health and safety. Sometimes it comes from overwhelming poverty and frequently from toxic damage of resource extraction um, to land and water. Uh, but I want to talk more about the efforts of people to fight those things. And uh, in particular, I want to talk about the United Mine Workers Health and Retirement Fund. Um, I'm a beneficiary as, uh, as a su surviving spouse of a union coal miner. So I get a little bit of money from the fund. And one of the things that was remarkable to me was during the COVID epidemic or pandemic, um, there was, I kept getting messages from them um, encouraging me to vaccinate. I mean, these are people that I felt really cared about me and cared about communities. And it was, it was very valuable for me. Um, I think that it's very important to understand that nothing happens progressive that, without a collective demand. And when, what John L. Lewis is doing here is he's expressing a collective demand of thousands of coal miners in coal mining communities. Um, that's what he's doing, and, and he's expressing their demand as people who have organized at great risk to both life and livelihood. So these are, these are collective demands um, from coal miners. Um, in 1946, the fund was created in an agreement between the union and the government after the Union threatened another strike. Now, they had struck during the Second World War, and the, and the um, government took over the mines, and that was the first time that they ever got any kind of real recognition. Um, and then they fought, were fighting to develop a health fund uh, with coal operators, and they got absolutely nowhere. So they finally threatened a strike, and the government intervened, and they demanded a 10 cent royalty on each ton of coal mined. Um, and with that money as a start, because the government did agree, um, they went through the coal fields and gathered up men who had been injured, um, paralyzed in, in coal mines. And they gathered them up all through the coal fields and they built hospitals. And I remember going to the hospital in Whitesburg, Kentucky, and seeing John L. Lewis's picture on the, uh, in the lobby of the hospital. Um, so the union actually built 10 hospitals in the region, and they brought these men in for rehabilitation. And that became a kind of a unique model for public health care in coalfield communities. Um, uh, it was comprehensive, it was accessible, and it was affordable. And I know because I was a member of that at a certain point. Um, unfortunately, the fund was still based on corporations. And as we know, really, healthcare should be based on the government, not on corporations, right? Um, 
so as my coal mine owners busted the union, health care declined. And the Mud Creek Clinic in Floyd County, Kentucky, was organized by an East Kentucky welfare rights organization with a remarkable working class woman in leadership, and that's Eula Hall. And we made a film about her um, and the clinic in the mid 80s. So I pulled a couple of clips from that that I'd like to show. These might be a bit loud, so, and I hope they're in sync. I may stop and try to catch up on it if it, if it does that again. You ride with them on the highway, you never expect what's out here. A lot of times in the winter, you could never get a car to this woman if you didn't have a four-wheel drive. This is not as bad as a lot of them. And a lot of times, you have to go places you think you couldn't get a wheel you know, hard to pick up a sick person. Like Um, yeah, it's wonderful. From uh, he was working at Vanderbilt at, at that time, I believe, um, Vanderbilt University. Um, I want to return to the mine workers, um, and, and of course, Eula was a great union person as well. Um, uh, but now to a struggle around health care in. Eight, in 1989-90, and we're about 50 miles from the site of the Pittston strike. Um, I don't know how many of you remember it, but it was pretty wonderful, actually. Um, and Gail Gentry begins and ends the film. He, he was paralyzed in one of Pittston's mines. So I'm going to play two clips from it. This is the first one. Um, Oops. I think maybe we didn't quite begin at the beginning. That's okay. One Monday morning, I went in to drill a hole put in roof bolts and rocks started moving behind so my buddy that I was working with, he sounded the top and hit sounded the drum in. So he run, but all I could do was just lean forward and the rock fell across my shoulders and it crushed out my bird brain, you know, and it just split my ribs. I didn't know how seriously I was injured except for the pain until when it was uh, get the rock and drag me out, I seen a new pair of boots coming along and, and I didn't realize it was mine. It, it sort of shocked me and uh, I couldn't feel my legs. 
going to try to let it catch up for a second. Okay. We'll try it again. Uh, I would have been out in about 10 years. I've been out. I got a letter from Piston to state that uh, as of February 1st, 1988, health benefits that we are provided under this contract will no longer be provided. These issues will be taken up during the upcoming negotiations with the union. They weren't responsible for any insurance or anything, you know. And so I, I just so angry about it. Uh, about three o'clock in the morning, don't hit us. A lot of everybody's for me to get up at night too, because they've got those uh, things and have a lot of trouble putting clothes on. So and I went to the table. I wrote a letter to the editor. That's how I first became involved. Okay. Um, I I hope you see the film, but um, let me tell you a little bit more about the strike. So there were four. Um, 4,000 civil disobedience arrests during the strike. Um, there was a campground, a solidarity campground that attracted union members from across the country, union cooks from the Greenbrier Inn up in West Virginia cooked for people. It, it was pretty great and it took me forever to finish the film. Uh, so I got to see past the victory. Technically, the miners won the strike with a new contract, and disabled miners, retirees, and widows still have their health care through the fund, um, although it was fought over for many years. Elaine Perkey sings at the end, died of COVID in a West Virginia hospital. Um, as for corporate history, Pittston was already responsible for the Buffalo Creek flood. Um, that killed 125 people. Um, they sold out all of their mines to Alpha, which merged with Massey, which is notorious. Um, and then they were charged $27.5 million by the Justice Department and the EPA for environmental damage and corruption. Alpha went into bankruptcy in 2015, emerged as a private company, and is still with us. And there's lots more, and I, I hope that Amy Branson speaks a little bit about what's going on now uh, around the, um, this toxic landfill that's about to go in in the Pittston um, strike place. Um, so I'm going to play one more clip from Pittston. That's the last clip I'm going to play, and then, um, and then summarize. Out of the coal fields at a helicopter site and look. Uh, I'm going to start over. The coal fields at a helicopter site. It's the coal fields sorry. At a helicopter site and look how the companies have raped this land. It's not to make you cry, but they're still our heels all this little bit. So that's Elaine Perkey singing. Um, she was the wife of a coal miner in West Virginia. Um, so 
when we look at health and wellness in Appalachia, I think we need not only a critique of um, the misery inflicted by land grabbers, international corporations, big pharmaceuticals, exploited private doctors, and neglectful government. Um, we also need the inspiration of collective demands on the corporations that exploit labor and extract resources from the region. And we need to fight for a government that cares about community health and well-being. Um, these demand long-term organizing of working class and poor people with depth, dignity, and creativity. Uh, film, I think, and other forms of media are only part of that work, um, but bring our senses to bear on struggle. Uh, and I think the core of that work has got to be the work that this institution and others are doing in the area of public health. Thank you. The folks online may, may have a, a, a slight down time as we change the battery and the camera, but um, unless David's battery runs low, I think we should be ready to roll here. Um, Thanks, Dr. Wyckoff, and it's great to be back here, um, see a lot of familiar faces. I really appreciate the, <clears throat> the invitation. So coal and, and coal mining have a variety of health effects, but today I'm going to limit my discussion to co-workers pneumoconiosis or, or black lung. I'll call it black lung throughout. So black lung is a occupational or work-related lung disease that's caused by chronic long-term inhalation of, of coal mine dust. And before I begin, I'm going to start with a few video clips that colleagues of mine at the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health recorded a few years ago. Um, these will be, uh, these are Eastern Kentucky coal miners. Uh, each of them were in their 30s and 40s at the time of recording. So we'll see if the videos work. The, the first miner, his name is Ray Anthony Bartley. He's from Eastern Kentucky. He was 48 at the time of mining. This next miner's name is uh, Peyton Michael Mitchell. He goes by Mikey. He was 42 at the time of filming. And then the 
third person here, is, his name is Mackie Branham Jr. Uh, he was 39 at the time of filming, also from Eastern Kentucky. So chest x-rays are, are commonly used to identify black lung in coal miners. Other, other tools like CTs are, are also used, but with x-rays, they pass through the body and onto a special plate and create what amounts to a negative image, where the solid structures show up as white and the uh, air-filled structures like the lungs show up as, as black or nearly black. So this is an example of a normal chest x-ray. And here it is alongside an x-ray from Ray Anthony Bartley. So he was the miner in the first video. The white areas in the lung zones are huge fibrotic masses, basically replacing normal lung tissue. Ray Anthony received a double lung transplant in 2022. This is Mikey Mitchell's x-ray. So he was the 42-year-old in the second video. He passed away 13 months after the video was filmed. This is Mackie Branham's chest x-ray. So he was the third minor. So again, you can see huge fibrotic masses, and in this case, rounded scarring patterns consistent with silicone exposure. Mackie received a lung transplant last year in 2023, and after a very difficult stretch in the hospital, he's, he's back home now. This is the lower section of Mackie's right lung that was removed during the surgery. So the other speakers have already alluded to this, but in this industry, in the coal mining industry, mine disasters are typically the catalyst for health and safety legislation. Some of you in the room might be old enough to remember the Farmington mine explosion in 1968. It killed 78 miners, and the public outcry after the explosion spurred congressional action. And that resulted in the Coal Mine Health and Safety Act, which was signed into law by President Nixon in 1969. It strengthened health and safety standards, increased the frequency of mine inspections. It created the Mine Safety and Health Administration, which is like the OSHA for mines. And it empowered NIOSH, which is the agency that I work for, to <coughs> conduct respiratory health surveillance, coal miners. And since 1970, NIOSH has done that. They've administered the Coal Workers Health Surveillance Program, which focuses on working miners. Health screenings occur in approved clinics that are around the country, typically in the coal fields. 
And NIOSH uses a mobile exam unit, so it's like a big band, to extend access. When we do that, we administer a health questionnaire, we collect a work history, we offer a chest x-ray and a breathing test called spirometry, and then we provide the results of those tests confidentially back to the miners. We also analyze the data that we collect to track national trends in black lung. So this graph shows the prevalence or the rate of black lung among working underground coal miners in Appalachia since the early 1970s, so right after the passage of the Coal Act. And it's broken down by mining tenure, so each of the lines you see is a different tenure group. The solid black line on the top represents the longer tenured miners, so they're typically in their 40s and 50s by the time they have 20 or 25 years of work experience. You can see that there was a steep decline in black lung rates following the passage of the Coal Act, but then sometime around the year 2000, there was a reversal. So now we're seeing uh, black lung rates in the region of about 20%. So one in five uh, experienced working coal miners has evidence of black lung. So the graph I just showed depicted data from the NIOSH surveillance program which has voluntary participation and is focused on working miners. We're often asked by others um, what we see in the other data sources that are available. And when we look at these other sources, which might include dust samples that are collected by MSHA, state and federal workers' compensation records, medical claims, vital statistics, so those are death records, um, and transplant registries, we generally come to a similar or same conclusion, and that's that the prevalence and the severity of black lung have increased in recent years, especially here in the Appalachian region. But the most compelling data that I've seen has been from the clinics in the region that see these miners, that treat these miners. In 2016, a community radiologist in eastern Kentucky, he was based out of Pikeville, he reached out to us at NIOSH about the high number of black lung cases he was seeing at his clinic. Ultimately, he identified 60 cases of severe black lung over a year and a half period. Most of these were miners who worked as either roof bolters or continuous miner operators. Both of those are very dusty jobs at the coal face. There was a lot of media coverage following this report, and it prompted other clinics in the region to contact NIOSH for help with measuring the burden of black lung at their clinics. The next person to contact us was Ron Carson. So at the time, he was the director of the Stone Mountain Black Lung Clinic in Lee County, Virginia. So Lee County is in the far southwestern corner of the state. As the crow flies, it's actually not very far from here. Uh, we visited Ron's clinic a couple times, and we worked with his staff to abstract medical records and to validate the x-ray findings. The published report in 2018 described 416 cases of severe black lung over a four-year period just at that clinic. 90% of the miners were from Kentucky and Virginia, and nearly one-third of them had a scarring pattern on their chest x-ray that was suggestive of silica exposure. We returned to the same clinic last year and worked with the new medical director to validate new cases. This time we included data from the other federally funded black lung clinics using a system built by researchers at the University of Illinois Chicago. The follow-up study was published just this past January and it identified 1,177 additional or new cases, mostly in Kentucky, Virginia, and West Virginia. As we spoke with the clinic staff, we heard a lot about silica over and over. Silica is a common component of coal mine dust, especially in Appalachia, and it's many-fold more toxic to lung tissue when compared to pure coal mine dust. We've also heard a lot about the silica problem from the miners themselves. Many of these quotes are about the conditions that they experience in the mines. So this is Jackie Yates. He's from southwest Virginia.
This is Danny Smith. He was featured in a NPR series uh, a couple years ago. He's from Eastern Kentucky. Harold Dotson, he's from Phelps, Eastern Kentucky. And this is Mackie Branham, Jr. again. He's talking about cutting a slope to access coal seam at a mine where he worked in Kentucky. Remember Ted Olson's uh, slide that he showed, the slope mine is where they have to cut through pure rock to get to the coal seam, which is horizontal. So to do this, he used a continuous mining machine, which is designed to cut softer coal rather than sandstone. And the sandstone formation underneath eastern Kentucky is more than 90% quartz-bearing silica. So it's, it's really horrifying to think about how toxic this dust was that he was inhaling when he was making this cut. These quotes that we've heard from miners are also consistent with what we've learned in more formal studies. So this was from a published report of 19 Appalachian coal miners living with severe black lung. They all reported regularly cutting through rock with machines that were designed to cut coal. And they also reported falsifying dust samples as directed by their employer. When we hear about cheating on dust samples, it typically involves hanging the sampling pump that they use uh, either in the clean air intake or in a lunch, pop, lunch box, lunch bucket, electrical panel, somewhere out, outside of the normal conditions of the mine. So doing that would artificially lower the total dust concentration on that sample. But it's more difficult to cheat for silica, which is measured as a percentage of total dust. And since 1970, while there's been a 17-fold decrease in the proportion of samples exceeding the exposure limit for total dust, as you can see here in the graph, the average percent silica in those samples has consistently stayed above 5% in Appalachia. And the x-rays that we collect at, at my agency, NIOSH, also implicate silica. This study found an eight-fold increase from the 1980s through about 2018, as you can see in the black bars, in the proportion of Appalachian coal miners with an x-ray pattern consistent with high silica exposures. During that same period, as you can see in the gray bars on the left, there was no change in this measure in the rest of the country. So taken together, stories and data can help convince the public that there's a problem worth addressing. That collective demand that Anne referenced a few minutes ago. It usually takes pressure, additional pressure, from health and safety advocates to help finally move the policy needle, especially on issues like black lung. And these days, most of those advocates who speak public, publicly and who testify before Congress are former miners. So this miner here, his name is Gary Hairston. He's from Fayette County, West Virginia. We've seen several important black lung policy reforms just in the last several years. But in the interest of time, I'll just highlight two. The first is intended to help miners who are living with black lung. And the second is more intended to um, prevent black lung from developing in the first place. So following that 2018 report that I referenced earlier, the one from the, the clinic in Lee County, Virginia, um, which at the time was the largest cluster of black lung ever reported in the, the medical literature, um, Congress, after that report, increased funding for black lung clinics by 40%. This was the first time in more than 20 years that the legislative branch and the White House had agreed to provide the maximum funding authorized by federal law. And we've heard directly from the clinics and clinic directors that this has made a really big difference in their ability to provide services to minors. The second reform is more focused on prevention. So last year, the Mine Safety and Health Administration, or MSHA, 
announced a proposed rule to lower the exposure limit for silica in the mines. It would also strengthen dust sampling protocols and promote access to a program that allows miners with the earlier signs of black lung to transfer to another job in the mines while retaining job benefits or job protections. Uh, we actually expect that final rule to be published any week now. This is just a slight extension of the same graph that, that Ted showed earlier, um, and it drives home the same point. And that's that when you look at national trends for coal mining jobs, it's undeniable that we're in a uh, long-term sustained decline. In the 1980s, there were 180,000 coal mining jobs in the U.S., and now there are fewer than 50,000. But as many of you know, especially those of you who live in the region, coal isn't going away just yet. The international market for steam coal is still driving production, and many Appalachian mines, especially in southwest Virginia and eastern Kentucky, have shifted their focus to metallurgic coal, which is used to make steel. And there's still a lot of international demand for that for obvious reasons. And then these are still really high paying jobs relative to almost any other local employment opportunity. Coal miners can earn low six figure incomes and even more if they're willing to work overtime. Think back on the comments from the video from Ray Anthony and from Mikey and from Mackie. Each of them took a lot of pride in their work and in their ability to provide for their families. And these are really common sentiments in Appalachia that are easily lost in the national conversation about the coal economy. It's undeniable that we're in a major energy transition in the United States, and we aren't building any new coal-fired power plants. But there are still tens of thousands of mining jobs in the region, and people will continue to line up for those jobs. So as a society, it's our responsibility to make sure that the conditions in those mines are as safe as possible. The opening line of the Coal Act from 1969, and it might be a little difficult to read here, but I'll read it for you. It says, the first priority and concern of all in the coal mining industry must be the health and safety of its most precious resource, the miner. There are different ways that we can live up to this. For public health people like me and for most of the people in this room, uh, it means avoiding complacency. For years, we thought black lung was on its way out, and we were wrong. For regulators, uh, including the, the regulatory agency responsible for, for mines, it means ensuring that miners are protected from toxic dust exposures, especially silica. For mine operators, it means maintaining safe conditions, and it also means taking corrective action when the conditions become unsafe. And for miners, it means feeling empowered and knowing that you're empowered to speak up when there's a problem without having to worry about losing your job. So I'll, I'll conclude with, with these photos here. They're, they're also by the photographer Earl Dodder, who I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Um, take, taken 44 years apart, um, but I believe it was a um, loosely attributed Mark Twain quote of uh, history doesn't repeat itself, but oftentimes it rhymes. And I, I think this drives that point home here is we're still fighting many of the, the same battles that we were in the 1960s and 70s and, and even before then. Um, so I think that's all I've got. And um, uh, like I said, it's, it's a real pleasure to be back here. And, and thank you for coming tonight. Well, I want to thank you all for being here this evening. That was a, a tremendous, multifaceted view of something that defines who we are as a people in a region. I want to thank the musicians that played earlier, the, the photographers outside, and especially our three panelists. Given, given the time, we're not going to take questions, but I suspect they'd be willing to talk to you privately after, after the event is over. So thank you all for being here.
and have a good evening.